I'm Dr. Molly Marty with Resiliency Matters. In this special pandemic edition, we are speaking with Dr. Anthony Flegg. Anthony is a doctor. He holds a master's degree in public health. He is an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico's Medical School. He is a writer. He has won awards for innovating programming with indigenous communities and so much more. Welcome, Anthony. It's great to be here. Thank you, Molly. I'm really curious how you would describe what you do, especially with the background of how your community health work impacts or maybe even improves your clinical um, physician, physician work. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I would say my healing work is occasionally done with a stethoscope and often done um, in, in the form of art, writing, movement, um, youth empowerment, very much beyond the clinic walls approaches to what makes a person and what makes a community healthy. Things that I feel I, I kind of can't do if I stay there with the stethoscope around my neck in, in a clinical setting. Um, I enjoy my clinical work and um, to your point, I think there's constantly ways that my patients teach me things, say, about strength-based approaches, um, love as a foundation for health that, you know, I, I don't quite get in other realms. Um, similarly, my community work often fuses into what I do in the clinic, and I can often um, right in, in a clinic visit, you know, offer something that I'm directly involved in, such as our running medicine program to someone who I've just found out is really struggling with isolation or really struggling with trying to control a chronic disease. I, it's nice to be able to say, well, you know, you, you can join me literally tomorrow. I won't be dressed the same like I am in the clinic. I'll be in running clothes and I'll be just a running coach. You're not allowed to call me doctor in that setting. Come join us, come, come out for a walk or run. You just covered several things I want to dig into deeper. Um, let's go back, you used the word love and I figured you would throw that out in your first answer because you actually refer to yourself as a love activist. What does this mean to you? I'm gonna take you back to one of the most vivid moments in my life of what love activism isn't and why we need it. And, and the moment is 2003. I'm at a um, war, a, a, a rally in Washington, DC to protest the war in Iraq. And people around me, as I'm trying to say hello, um, just, just greet people, they are literally um, gripping their picket signs, their, their protest signs, harder and harder, and they're so gripped by fear and anger. Um, the same fear and anger that I would say was in that moment creating the war that they were so staunchly opposed to. Um, so the idea of an angry activist, the idea of someone who gets burnt out from, from really trying to make a difference in the world, I think often stems from oh, what, do, what are you here to do? Well, I'm here to fight the system. Oh, I'm here to fight the man. I'm here to fight the federal government. I'm here to fight the Indian Health Service. Whatever it is that you're against, I don't believe that that form of activism is, is ultimately that effective. Um, and it sure doesn't serve to, to um, generate a, a sense of fulfillment that more thinking about what do I believe in? What, what, is the, what are the ideals that I want to see born into this world? Um, and, and can I use that to fuel my, my activism, what I believe in as opposed to what I'm against? And that's a, a great segue. You also mentioned the strength-based approach. And I know you're passionate about asset mapping and strength-based approach. Um, our, our research and our work strongly overlaps there. Tell our viewers what is strength-based approach um, in action and why is it important? Why does it matter? I walk into a patient room recently and the patient 
with a smile on her face, before I can say anything, says, Dr. Flegg, I've been a bad patient. So I am stuck for a second because um, usually I'm going to start the interview with a question like, what are you grateful for today? Um, you know, describe your life in the pandemic in one word, things that are, are more humanizing. So I stand there for a second. I, I kind of take a moment. Okay, so she's, she, wants, she wants me to hit her wrists and slap her wrists with, uh, and, and kind of affirm that she's a bad patient. So my, my line back to her after a few seconds of thinking, I smiled at her and I said, well, have you been a good person? The next 10 minutes was explicitly not about anything around her being a bad patient or her health. It was about how she was doing. It was actually, I really genuinely wanted to know how she was as a person because I, I was really worried that as a kind of proxy for health, if she's really walking around and, and it has so medicalized her own self that she only thinks of her self-worth in realms of what's my blood sugar, how am I do it taking my medications, that, that I'm worried and I sure don't want her to leave my office without me as a trusted part of her life saying, no, that, that's, that's not at all how you're going to continue living. Um, that's not at all how I see you. I don't, I don't see you in any way as the, the, the person that you offered up a bad patient. Um, so strength-based work is looking in those nooks and crannies and crevices for the beauty. The beauty is always there. Um, it's there in our most unsuspecting places and people and communities. And it's just waiting for someone to, to kind of find that, that little gem, that little seed, put some water on it, put some fertilizer on it, and, and, and for a moment ignore the more glaring things that are kind of tempting you to really pay attention um, and, and more say, how can we grow what's positive here as a way to improve health as opposed to our default, which is um, by paying attention to all of the negative diseases, deficits, deficiencies, addictions. Um, the thought is, I don't think it's a, a valid thought, but the thought is by paying attention only to those that that's the best way to improve health of a person or of a community. Unfortunately, we have more and more research uh, that is uh, supporting the, the efficacy and the power of these strength-based approaches. You also mentioned your um, running medicine, and that's another theme that runs through your work, no pun intended. Talk about movement as medicine. I, I always struggle because I, I default to, you know, who's running that running medicine, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I need, I am constantly trying not to do that. But, um, well, Molly, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you, first of all, just a, a, a kind of also interesting example. So running medicine is a very unique approach to getting families and communities moving, um, started out of my passion and just my own experience in running as being um, something incredibly powerful, but bigger than running, movement, um, being powerful for um, mental health, emotional health, physical health. And I would even say, given that my work is largely with Native American communities, um, cultural health, culture um, and running may not be something that people across the country connect, but in many tribes, particularly Southwest tribes that I work most closely with, running is integrated into um, ceremonies. Running is thought of a, a way that we connect to our larger purpose, to larger life, to the earth below us. It's literally dancing on mother earth as, as one group um, coined. And so in running medicine, working with, again, primarily native communities in five years, um, I have never mentioned the word diabetes. I've never mentioned the word heart disease. I've never mentioned the word hypertension. And when I'm asked, you know, Dr. Flegg, that is, is running medicine a disease prevention program? My answer is no, it's a life promotion program. I, I'm about really showing people 
in an hour that they come to walk and run with us, what true health looks like. And, and I don't want to confine that by talking about how, you know, running is, is good to prevent diabetes. I really want to promote and, and to the end talk about um, a, a strength-based, a wellness kind of idea. I want to show you without any words needed what true health can look like for yourself and have you experience it in a loving, supportive, inclusive environment. Um, and, I, and I don't want to negate it by throwing in a five-minute lecture on, you know, blood pressure or um, a chronic disease at the end. So um, medicine has been a, a real, real changer for me in just, you know, you create something and you think about how it's going to change the world around you, but it's, it's changed me very much um, to, to just, just to believe in the power of community of people very coming from very different backgrounds and places in their lives and fitness levels to support each other's wellness. And I mentioned to you that when uh, I started the work of Worldmaker, started as a community resiliency project, um, we had we brought people together and we had running clubs and in yoga movement as well. Um, and one thing that really stands out from the success of your club, and, and I look even at how the one we started nearly a decade ago, uh, people are still gathering around that work. I think there are a lot of people listening and they're part of a community and they're saying, well, I really want to do some work. I want to invest in youth or I want to help veterans or I love to support elderly people or whatever your you know jam is. And they think, but I don't have any money. I, I, I don't know where to start. And, and you've done this with very little money and I know that that's, that's been our history. What are those other pieces that you see as instrumental in bringing a community together? Like you, do you understand the question? That's okay. What great. themes are you seeing across? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I wish more people asked this of me and, and that I got to talk about um, this. So when Running Medicine started, which came out of our nonprofit Native Health Initiative that had already been doing love-grounded, love-funded work um, to give listeners just a, a very tangible, an entire nonprofit operating on about $3,000 a year for um, a full array of, of programs, youth programming, et cetera. So it, it only seemed natural that the way we would start running medicine was in my living room with 15 people crowded in, not a single cent, not a single um, even bit of effort toward raising funds. In fact, I guess I, I worry that if, if you make money the basis of it, let's, let's say you call those people together in a nice boardroom um, and you say the reason for coming together is I have a couple thousand dollars for each of you to pay as stipends. How does that change the ability to just come together and really um, you know, find a, a singleness of purpose among the group? How does it affect even who's in the room? Um, so I was actually very intentional that I wanted when running medicine was, was sprouting to not have any money. I, I, I also did not think that money was in any way going to be one of the necessary ingredients for the recipe to be successful. And um, so a, a strong group of people, let me say it different, a, a group of people that strongly um, believe in, in a single purpose and can connect over that mission, I think is all that you need for change to happen. Absolutely. And then I would love to keep talking about being welcoming and inclusive and having creativity and self-care, all those, all those pieces that you write about. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about your writing. Um, as I mentioned, viewers, Dr. Flagg is a writer, so stay tuned and we'll talk about his blog. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected.
As the nation's doctor, I often get asked, what should I do if I think I might have coronavirus? People who are sick should stay home. You don't go to an emergency room. You don't go to a clinic. You get on the phone and you ask for advice and instructions from your physician. We don't want you to go into the ER or the doctor's office without talking to them first because you might spread coronavirus to someone else. Please visit coronavirus.gov for more information. Thank you for virtual family dinners and long distance birthday wishes. Thank you for sweet streaming melodies and spontaneous dance parties. Thank you for keeping classrooms together and learning alive. Thank you to our incredible network of employees who make all these beautiful connections possible. Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Marty, and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Anthony Clegg. And Anthony, we were just talking about your writing. And I want to start with the very first blog of yours that I read at your Writing to Heal uh, blog. And it's called, There is Still Normal Versus There is Nothing Normal. Would you read all or part of that? It's a pretty brief blog. Um, do you have that handy? And can you share that with our viewers? Indeed. Thank you. Here is the piece. Lines of signs, bagpipes, cursing. I approach the hospital, a real life doctor in a virtual world here to provide real live healing. Like all of us, I vacillate between there is still normal and nothing is normal. Arriving at the hospital, stethoscope gently embracing my neck, I try to convince myself of the former. These three reminders shove me toward the latter line of signs, bagpipes, cursing. The line of signs make, makes me gasp, lining a long entrance into the hospital, some printed and some professional, but the ones that induce tear ducts into action are the handmade ones. In quotes, for the time you spend helping me when I'm sick, thank you. Whenever there is a headache, fever, or the flu, illness, no illness stands a chance against a doctor like you. Thank you for saving lives during these hard times. Hashtag you are awesome. I walk over to have a moment with the row of signs. Gratitude for this display of kindness we are seeing in the last months. Not just for healthcare workers, but gratitude for all who are keeping, who keep on putting themselves at risk to keep food on our table. All who keep our cities and towns safe and functional. Gratitude toward the parents turned school teachers and for the teachers and barbers and shopkeepers and neighbors, everyone who brings joy and meaning to our lives. The signs, a signal of the wave of kindness this collective moment has inspired. Bagpipes. As I stand with the signs, I'm not sure I'm hearing right. Being a family physician, I immediately think of the most likely diagnosis, auditory hallucination. But the music continues, approaching the hospital entrance the bagpipe player comes into view. Living in New Mexico, these Scottish instruments do not grace our present often, often, definitely not in hospital entrance ways. I listen to the slow, mournful wailing. The bagpipes speak very clearly to me as I watch a group of healthcare workers take in the melody. It is a moment to heal together, people needing strength to go back inside and care for those weakened by disease. Yes, we did have a few hospitalized with COVID, but the bigger population needing us are all the non-COVID patients who lay socially isolated in scary hospital rooms, stripped of family members at bedside due to the pandemic. The bagpipes, a signal of the collective suffering to be acknowledged and the ways we find meaning in coming together to mourn, grieve, cry, and wail. But I wasn't in the building yet. A loud argument reaches my ears. Two cars, drivers shouting at top of lungs to each other. Seemingly, one had stripped the varnish off the other's humanity by some move on the highway. We call this New Mexico driver syndrome. Do they not realize all of us can hear them? Do they not see the signs or hear the bagpipes in front of them? I guess, in a way, this is a nice compliment to the other two, a showing of raw emotion escalated by the pandemic pressure cooker 
in which we all find ourselves huddled. Let it out, curse it out. This cursing could even be healthy healing in a virtual world without outlets for stress relief, the Socrates in me ponders. Now I am really stuck. I have yet even to step in the building when I hear and hear what has changed since a week earlier. I have not even gotten to the part where I learn how my societal etiquette for today includes things I never thought to do or not to do just days prior. I can't even get there because I'm stuck on signs of kindness, pipes of mourning, and stress-induced cursing. All three, the raw emotions of the moment, nothing needing to be processed or diagnosed, but simply gulped down along with the fresh New Mexico air of the day as something true to the moment. Gathering myself, I step toward the front door. One thing cleared up for the moment. Battle between there is still normal and nothing is normal is quite clear. Thank you for that. I think, you know, your, your blog's called Writing the Heal Blog. And I just think that that creates a space for people who nothing's the same. And yet we have, we grasp to the normality and the, you know, what is normal. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Another blog you wrote, you're talking about running and you were feeling slow and you were feeling sluggish. And you thought of a friend's wisdom. Your friend said, don't fight the current, find it and flow with it. And for our viewers who are listening and, uh, you know, months into this pandemic, talk a bit about that wisdom of, of using that mantra, flow with it. Yeah, well, first of all, I think my, my hope would be in, in someone hearing um, any of this is just to, a light bulb to go off of, um, am I finding those creative outlets for myself to heal and particularly in, in the pandemic, um, writing may be an outlet. You may have some other creative thoughts, but um, if someone, if I, if I had a choice, I'd rather someone from our conversation today, Molly, be inspired to write themselves than them ever visiting anything I've written. Um, the flow with it piece, yeah, I think means that, that um, if I spend energy today really fighting against the, the obvious current, for instance, um, telling me to socially distance when I, when I just want to see my friends and get back to some normalcy, then, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, I guess, accepting the, it, maybe it's about acceptance, acceptance of the present, and the present isn't what my norm was in February 2020. I need to flow with it. I need to find it, find what it is, and, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll do myself some good by, just learning to go with what this moment, this week is, is telling me is our um, kind of norm. Yeah, making space, being gentle with ourselves, uh, having gratitude coming from that place and, and creativity. It is healing, it is powerful. So I appreciate your invitation for people to explore uh, movement and art and writing and, and whatever that might look like. I'm gonna shift gears a bit, you know, as a medical professor and as a white man, I know you've been very engaged in looking at what role can you play in um, not only apologizing, owning up, um, actively being anti-racist, but how do you teach medical students how um, to step into these conversations? Uh, where are you with all of this? I, again, you write about these things on your blog, um, but talk to us about this. It's, it's gotten more real for me this week. We are in the first week of the new medical students and physical assist, physician astu, assistant students, PA students at UNM. And we as, as faculty have really taken this as a moment to um, include content in an orientation around an, an anti-racist approach to health and healthcare healing. Um, so it really puts me in a, in a very vulnerable position. I think it's actually quite freeing to be in a room as I was just an hour ago with students and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm no longer your professor. I'm someone who is just trying to learn from you and along with you a better way of doing things, a way of um, uh, creating society far bigger than, than anything in like the healthcare system specifically or medical school a society that um, 
is is not driven by racism and and a white supremacy culture that um, clearly um, gives some people unfair advantage and others unfair disadvantage. Gives some people unfair um, uh, ability to live with all of the social determinants of health and other people deprived of those same things. Um, so, and I think I, I try to approach those conversations with just starting with um, as a white male, a lot of unearned privilege as a physician. I, I really am, am coming to you all as students, as future colleagues with just a interest in learning and not, not any sense of I'm about to teach you how to be anti-racist. I have to really listen and particularly listen to perspectives that um, as a white male, I don't know what it's like to live as uh, a, a DACA recipient, a uh, LGBTQ youth, a African-American women. Um, so I, I really just, I need to listen and I need to learn from, from voices that maybe I have not listened to enough. Very, very wise. Uh, one of our board members at Worldmaker pointed out that there's a big difference between not speaking out of complicity and not speaking because you're listening. And, and that's really um, a wise space to, to be in and be in mindfully. Um, we have time, I think, to cover one more of your blogs. And you wrote about a young woman named Amelia Pino, and you called her healer of today. And how she went to work and she wanted all 270 youth to receive an educational kit with age appropriate books and games and supplies. She wrote a grant, which I know as a researcher, you said, quote, something that most folks twice her age shudder to think about doing, <laughs> spoken as a true academic. Um, but you talked about how she's collecting money and supplies and, and working with such joy to distribute those care packages, um, using much of her summer for that, and then hoping to inspire other youth to step up and lead similar efforts in their tribes and in their communities. That phrase really stopped me in my tracks, uh, healer of today. It's so powerful. Talk more about this in our, in our last few minutes together. Healer of today is a reminder that our young people have incredible wisdom um, to make changes, to, to be at the table when, for instance, we're looking at solutions, particularly to issues affecting youth. And by saying tomorrow, future, um, we, in essence, relegate our youth to silence and, and not being at the table. Anthony, thank you for all of your work, for being such an inspiring world maker, and we appreciate your time and wisdom today. Viewers, thank you for joining us on Resiliency Matters. MC22, your local programming leader, take good care and remember, we thrive together. <laughs>